Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Ben, the Young Adults Leader here. I think most of you know me. Um, Raja will be back next week with Corinthians, but for now we're finishing up Romans 12. If you've missed the last week or another week, a few uh, about a month ago, I think, uh, we've been going through Romans 12. We've done verse 1 and verse 2, so we'll go on from there this week, but um, let's recap what we had talked about. Um, since the topic was Romans, we talked about the Roman church and how it was this, the, the most Gentile early church. And Paul was happy to be rewriting the letter to them as he saw himself as the apostle for the Gentiles. I'm going to need that. Um, yeah, Rome itself was the center of the world and was incredibly depraved with every vice imaginable um, and everything evil being available at a moment's notice, really. There was a saturation of religion in the culture with temples to every deity and every god imaginable. Uh, yeah, there were daily rituals, daily sacrifices, and the citizens were constantly busy with fitting in, either to their fellow Romans or to their religious institutions. In the middle of all of this lay the fresh new Roman church, and it was a primarily Gentile church because all of the Jews in the city had been kicked out. There had been this great conflict in the city between the Jews and the Gentiles over who Jesus was. And it became such a big deal that the emperor at the time kicked out all the Jews. And so while they did eventually return, most of the church was Gentile. And there was this little bit of a division in the church that way. And many of the, the themes of Romans tie into this division with the goal of providing a united and more complete look at the eternal plan of God for the salvation of sinners. And Christ was always at the center of this. The first 11 chapters of Romans set the stage with deep theological truths. From the evil nature of humanity to um, the purpose of the Old Testament laws to Christ's final sacrifice. This all builds towards the practical instruction in chapter 12. Beginning, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. A real sacrifice, we learned, is, something, is surrendering something valuable for hope of God's favor. A sacrifice can't be an afterthought. It has to have real, significant value. It's giving away something good to replace it with something great. Sacrifices must be made in the right state of mind, and they should be part of our daily life. Paul also tied in the image of slavery into the sacrifice, Offering your bodies as a living sacrifice is willfully choosing slavery for yourself. It's giving up any control you have. It's giving up your desires, your dreams, even your loved ones. It's putting those items on the altar and accepting their death. There's a balance with this, though, because while we are his slaves, he's shown the grace of considering us his sons and daughters. Being a slave does not mean fearfully obeying, but it means obeying out of reverence for all that he's done for you, all of the mercies of God. We saw both of these analogies being tied together to show the absolute ownership God has of us while matching it with the utter belonging we have in him. He's this gentle and loving dad. With that laid out, we come to understand that every moment is his, every talent is his, and every penny is already his. So being a living sacrifice is just recognizing the reality of our relationship with God. Then last week we came to verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Here we dwelt on the idea of being affected by the evil around us, how it's so easy to believe that while it may bother others, it's fine for me to be around sin. It doesn't affect me. But as complicated as our brains are, they are incredibly simple to affect. How arrogant do you have to be to think that the sin around you doesn't affect you, but holding a pencil in your mouth does, right? It, it's, it's, it's baffling. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. We need to be careful about becoming lax with sin. Our friendship with the world leads to becoming enemies of God. Of course, this doesn't mean that we have to live in this um, Christian bubble and don't interact with anything of the world, any tech, any trends, or anything like that. There's a difference between enduring the world and loving it. And there's also a big difference between trendy and worldly. Just as drums were once considered contentious for churches, um, there are always new things that are mistaken for worldly and sinful, when really all they are are trendy. One thing we really need to watch out for, though, is peer pressure, especially unconscious peer pressure. 
we love being mimicked and we love mimicking. Um, whether that's tapping a foot or swinging a hammer, we do it to feel safe, to feel connected, and to blend in. We will even conform to things we know are false if there's a group of as small as four people that are strongly disagreeing with us. Our culture is especially skilled at doing something evil, then slowly changing our mind to it until it feels wrong not to support it. It doesn't take evil intention when the natural state of our hearts is already evil. All it takes is a little apathy or a little pressure, even when we blatantly know the truth. So we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And it's a simple process. Small physical actions have great power. Just like holding that pencil in your mouth measurably makes you happier. We need to exercise discipline and keep doing good habits to renew our minds. The more we do them, the more we want to do them. And it becomes this positive transformational circle. This transformation is especially exciting because the verse says that by the renewing of our minds, we'll be able to test and approve, oh, where? Test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. However, God's will isn't always that audible voice telling you to get married or move across the country or where to go to school. It also doesn't give us mystical insight into special signs that confirm what we want to hear. This is where I maybe went a bit too hard last week. Um, I said, have you run into someone who says, I know this is what I'm supposed to do because I have a piece about it. And then I called that ridiculous. And while I stand by the point I was making, maybe I could have done it better. Peace is a fruit of the Spirit. It's absolutely something that we should be experiencing and embodying. What I was trying to do was call out this, this feel-good Christianity. If you're relying on peace to know the will of God, you're doing it wrong. Especially because when we see examples of someone finding out God's specific will for them, peace is never the feeling that they experience. So if you've made a decision that you feel peace about, it's not necessarily a bad thing. But if you're using that peace to know the will of God, I'd challenge you on that. So the point is that we are unreliable. Our natural instincts are towards evil, not good. The pattern of the world has shaped us. We need to be in the Bible so much to counteract the pattern of the world. So if you're seeking the will of God, don't rely on yourself. Don't rely on your feelings. We need to look for a solid rock to rely on, the word of God. The more we dwell in the word of God, the more our minds are renewed, the more we are transformed, and the more we understand the will of God. So when you're looking to make a decision, don't look for a sign or a feeling to confirm what you already want to hear. Instead, um, read your Bible, think biblically, pray biblically, and seek counsel from people that do this, and then repeat and repeat every single day. The more we do that, the more we transform us ourselves through this repetition. We need to exercise these muscles for that to, to really transform us. So then when we come to a hard decision, we'll have a path forward. And it's not necessarily this mis mystical answer because hard decisions are part of the Christian life. God would not have given us the book of Proverbs if he didn't want us to make decisions. He, he, he's given us the tools on how to make decisions and now we have to do that. So the focus of these two, the first two verses that we had talked about is on our bodies and then on our minds. Uh, but Paul continues Romans 12 in a very collective manner. Rather than just focusing on our own bodies and our own minds, it's, it's more about the body of believers. So um, let's look at how this continues and Paul's little warning to us. Um, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give, you each, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. Why would Paul warn us to not get cocky right after giving us this command to sacrifice ourselves and um, renew our minds? He needed to immediately jump into a reminder that we each have a specific purpose, but only as part of a greater body. Paul doesn't want us to take the first two verses as specifically personal instruction. We need to think of them in terms of this, this collective body of Christ. With that in mind, let's quickly jump back to verse 1. 
I urge you, brothers and sisters, it's already this plural idea, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies, not body singular, as a living sacrifice. So body plural, sacrifice singular. So all of us together are the living sacrifice. It's not one person that is this living sacrifice. It's all of us. That's so interesting. The idea of collective is all the way through this. It was never supposed to be an instruction to the individual. And, and this true and proper worship, it can be translated as this, this Levitical temple duty. It, it, it's written in a way to, to draw these parallels to the Old Testament temple and all of the, the worshipful duties that each Levite had and how they worked together in this, this worship and sacrifice system. So, yeah, we, we each have different gifts. In, in, the same, yeah, in the same way, each member of the church keeps our church running and keeps it functioning by offering ourselves as a living sacrifice. We each have different gifts and different purposes, but no one can do it all by themselves. There's a real danger to trying to live the Christian life in isolation. So let's look at uh, an Old Testament great to, to look at what it would look like to live the Christian life in isolation. In Judges chapter 13 through 16, we get the story of Samson. Samson's pretty famous. He's got nice long hair and big, strong biceps. Um, at this point in Israel's history, the nation had been established. They had made it to the promised land and were in the process of kicking out or dealing with some of the other nations around them, like the Philistines. There was no king at this time, and what we think of as normal, traditional nation structures didn't really exist. They were more like a loose body of tribes that worked together when necessary, um, but definitely not always working together and definitely not always following God. And so when they were doing a lot of evil, God would give them up to their enemies. And then once they had begun to repent, he'd send a judge who would lead them against their captors. So here's Israel living in subjugation to the Philistines for the last 40 years. And finally, God chooses Samson to be a great leader, a judge who will deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Many of the stories of the judges start with God choosing someone. And then that person galvanizes the Israelites together into a fighting force that throws off their shackles and reclaims their homeland. And very often, these, I, these stories focus on the ideas of uniting one another and God's plan of redemption for the community. But Samson's story is a little different. Rather than focusing on the uniting of the tribes, it, it focuses on him. Instead of focusing on God's plan of redemption for the community, it's about Samson. That's because Samson doesn't do the job of a classical judge. He doesn't unite Israel. He doesn't bring them together. He doesn't even free them from the Philistines. He starts fights and seeks out violence by himself, and that's it. Rather than seeking God's will, he does what he wants, and he doesn't worry about the consequences. Samson had been chosen from birth to follow a strict set of rules that included the classic don't cut your hair, but also he wasn't supposed to have any wine or grapes, and he wasn't supposed to touch any dead bodies or carcasses or anything like that. Uh, he was supposed to be set apart and holy, not tainted by the patterns of this world. Samson, of course, was terrible at following all these rules. Um, he, he was the opposite of all of this. He was so infected by the world that even with his immense strength, he didn't really fight the, the right fight. He lived in an area controlled by the Philistines and soon was infatuated by one of their women. Instead of um, staying in his own community, he decided to pursue that woman and they get married and he breaks all his rules immediately. He, he fights a lion and then eats honey out of its dead body, immediately breaking the, the dead carcass rule. And then at the wedding ceremony, the way it's written, it, it heavily implies that he was drinking a whole lot of wine. So most likely he broke the first two, like immediately. That's the first story of Samson, him breaking two of his three rules. Uh, so, so this isn't exactly somebody who's upright and following all the, the laws that God has set for him. And during this wedding, he becomes very angry quickly because, well, he told a riddle and the guys guessed it right and then he goes on a killing spree. The, the point of the riddle was to make a little bit of money. Like, this guy's motivations are all over the place. He isn't our, our paragon of virtue, this, this judge that will righteously free the land from the Philistines. He's, he's not that figure. He was a confident and engaging man and he was definitely physically imposing and because of that, he mainly relied on himself. He never went looking for help. He never had a trusted confidant. He just got himself into trouble and then fought his way out over and over again through his story. That's all that he does. 
he surrounds himself with evil people, gets angry at them for something that they do, kills some people, and goes back to whatever he was doing. Do you remember the story of the foxes? He goes out and catches 300 foxes, and then in pairs ties their tails together and ties like a torch to them, lighting the entire countryside on fire when he releases them. Do you know why he did that? Because after his wedding, when he was so angry at them guessing his riddle and him having to pay them back what he had promised, he leaves town for a long time, the day after his wedding. Doesn't tell anyone, and, and everyone's assuming that he's abandoned them. So the, the father of the bride decides, well, she needs to get married and gives his, his Samson's wife to the best man. And then they're married together. And so he comes back months later and finds his wife in the arms of somebody else. And so out of revenge, out of anger, because of his own mistakes, he goes and burns down the whole countryside. Not because of like some righteous will of God, not, because, not to free the Israelites, just to cause trouble because he was dumb. That's it. This, this, so many of his great feats, his moments of, of strength are nothing more than personal rage. Eventually, this leads to his tragic death where after being captured and tortured, he sacrifices his life to kill many Philistines. But even then, this is his prayer. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O oh God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. This was selfish. All he wanted was revenge. He wanted to get revenge on what they had done to him. This wasn't about saving Israel. This wasn't about um, God's people or, or doing a good thing. It was just these people were mean to me, probably because of something I did, and I want my revenge. He's, yeah, th this is not this, this upright figure that we should be looking to ever, really. Who was he sacrificing to? This, this wasn't the, the, the image of living sacrifice that we talked about a few weeks ago. It may have been a sacrifice, but definitely not the living sacrifice. We learned that a sacrifice should be made in the right state of mind. It looks more like he's sacrificing himself to himself, not to his God, not to his community. This is all out of revenge. That's not a living sacrifice. Maybe it's like a, a conformed sacrifice. I don't know. This guy needed to read Romans 12, but the timing of Paul's letter didn't exactly line up with that. So he's so focused on himself that he doesn't ever seem to see the bigger picture. He thinks he has the strength to take on his challenges. He thinks he's strong enough to stand against evil. All he's strong enough to do is to get into trouble. And that's us. When we think we're, we're strong enough to stand on our own against whatever, this is what it looks like. We're a mess. We, we, we make the wrong decisions. We make it about us, focused on what we think is best in the moment for us. But with, with a heart of evil, that doesn't lead to good. We begin to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Through life and community, however, we can more clearly see other people's strengths and through that, sometimes that can show us our own weaknesses and where we can rely on others and then partner together for the greater mission. If Samson had followed the path of previous judges or simply relied on anyone but himself, he may have been a much more effective judge, bringing freedom and safety to those around him. The point of this judge was to unite Israel and provide freedom. But since he was unable to do that, he stands as a warning of what it looks like when we don't work together, when we aren't united. He was just one piece of the body. He should have been empowering all the other pieces in the body, working together, united to accomplish something great. With just one gift, with just one strength, what hope do you have against the kingdom of darkness? The Roman church was a divided church, with the Jews and Gentiles being at odds with each other. Hearing from Paul that they needed to be one body, to not be cocky and rely on themselves, but to be one body with many parts, united, would have stood out to them. Don't think that you're better than you really are. Don't be cocky. Don't think you can do it all. You may have a special function, a special gifting, but you're not all the gifts. You can't do it all by yourself. It's only one function of many. So unite together as the body of Christ. We, we, we belong to each other. Offering our bodies as a living sacrifice isn't walking into the enemy, forgetting all of the other Christians around us and dying to defeat a bit of evil. It's uniting to remove evil entirely from our communities. It's uniting and doing good, changing the lives of all of those around us, not just ourselves. Community makes a huge difference in our lives. Instead of surrounding ourselves with people who have conformed to the pattern of this world, if we partner together with those looking to renew their minds, then we can transform not only ourselves, 
but our surroundings as well. Do you remember last week when we looked at Aaron, who was so conformed by the world that he ended up leading the whole Israelite community in a festival of sin? Well, while they were building their golden calf and celebrating in front of it, Moses was on top of the mountain, getting instructions on how to build a holy dwelling place for God, the tabernacle. God had carefully designed this building and had even given certain people in the community special giftings so that the Israelites could make this building perfectly. And then Moses came down the mountain with all those instructions. He, with his mind filled with the perfect dwelling place of God, saw that contrasted with a community celebrating sin, with, with an evil and depraved culture, even in his chosen special community. This was really hard on both Moses and God, and for the next little bit, they chatted about whether everyone should die or not. Um, by the grace of God, it ended up being that they were going to spare them. So, so praise the Lord. Uh, the Israelites saw what they had done, and, and they repented. Afterwards, the entire community banded together to make this special building. They brought their treasure, they used their God-given talents, and they devoted their time to making this holy place perfect. All whose hearts were stirred and whose spirits were moved came and brought their sacred offerings to the Lord. They brought all the materials needed for the tabernacle, for the performance of its rituals, and for the sacred garments. All the women who were skilled in sewing and spinning prepared blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine linen cloth. All the women who were willing used their skills to spin the goat hair into yarn. The Lord has gifted Bezalel, Oholiab, and the other skilled craftsmen with wisdom and ability to perform any task involved in building the sanctuary. Let them construct and furnish the tabernacle, just as the Lord has commanded. All of them coming together with their gifts, with their talents, with their money, everything, um, united to prepare this special place. When we live in the pattern of the world, not all hope is lost. We still have the chance to repent and become part of a transformative community, to be part of building the temple of God, to be part of the body of Christ, while your gifting might not be spinning goat hair into yarn um, or crafting fancy things out of gold or silver, we each have a key part of being the body of Christ. Romans 12 clarifies, Romans 12 clarifies, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. That's Romans 12, verse 6 to 8. One of the primary purposes of this holy building was to offer sacrifices to God and also to worship him. But I guess those are the same thing, right? We learned when looking at Romans 12, 1, that offering yourself as a living sacrifice is real worship. This living sacrifice is your true and proper worship. It's with that temple language, that this is your Levitical duty in the temple. This is, this is your worship, this is your ceremony, this is your part of the body of believers worshiping. Joining as a community to worship, to give sacrifices, is a significant part of the tabernacle, and it's a significant part of Romans 12. Sometimes it's easy to take part in a, in a wonderful community when everyone is jumping in and you're surrounded by celebration and excitement. But it's not always that easy. A few hundred years later in the history of Israel, they end up in captivity again, this time exiled from their home and taken to Babylon. Here it was easier than ever to be conformed to the pattern of the world. They had been taken out of their patterns and separated from their institutions. Even their Jewish names were taken from them but they still had each other. Here, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego all worked together to maintain their allegiance to God. They encouraged each other to continue to follow his laws, even when everyone else around them had abandoned this. They didn't eat what everyone else ate and relied on God to provide for them. God honored them, and they were promoted to high-ranking positions in the Babylonian kingdom. From there, instead of conforming to the world, they continued to try to make a positive difference. Later on, they are again confronted with the pattern of the world and told to conform or die. A giant golden statue was set up and they were told to bow down to it or be thrown in the furnace. They didn't take the Samson approach of trying to kill everyone. 
and they didn't take the previous Israelite approach of bowing down to a golden idol and joining in in the festivities. They, instead, they stood firm. When asked why they wouldn't bow, they said this. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. They together stood firm. They didn't look to start a fight or to give in, but instead just simply stood firm. So they were led to the furnace where it had been heated to seven times its normal temperature, and then they were thrown in. It was so hot that the people throwing them into the furnace died from the heat. But suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. And they walked out unharmed, protected by the power of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. Instead of being conformed by the world, they stood firm. This led to them being an amazing witness for God, providing hope for Jews in exile giving them freedom to live a faithful life without as much persecution or fear. All of a sudden, the whole known world was no longer in trouble for worshiping this God, but encouraged almost. That, that's, that's amazing. The, the difference they can make, that, that transformation by s together standing firm as the body. The idea of a community of faith is an amazing thing. However, being in a body of believers isn't just about making our lives easier or renewing our minds. It's also about actively making a difference, both in each other's lives and the world around us. Romans 12 continues, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, Faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were great examples of this passage. Maybe they had that advanced copy of Romans 12 that Samson didn't. They were caring for one another in a hostile land. Devoted to one another. Praying constantly. But they didn't look to start any fights. They blessed as they were cursed. In their persecution, in their affliction, they were patient and faithful in prayer. The Roman church needed this reminder that they were to look like this instead of being divided. Instead of the cultural differences and squabbles, they were to be a singular body that was making a difference for their members and the community around them. Paul had been seeing these types of believers as faith was spreading around the world. The church started out with so much care for its members. Like in Acts 2 verse 44, we see, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. This sounds like a church I'd love to be a part of. I, I hope this is what UCC is like. It's vibrant, caring, and active. People are using their gifts, their time, their talent, and their treasures to bless their fellow believers. Since we're part of the same body, it's care like this that's properly caring for your own body. Wait a minute. Romans 12, verse 4 to 5. For just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We are one body. This community is our body, according to Paul here. What are we supposed to do with our body? We're supposed to be a living sacrifice. 
I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. We as a community, as a singular, plural body, are to offer us as a living sacrifice. We as the body of Christ, in the same way that he sacrificed himself, are to live that sacrifice out every day. Our temple duty is to come together as a community in worship and sacrifice, giving him everything that we collectively have to build the kingdom, to be the holy dwelling place of God on earth. When we try to do this alone, we look like Samson. It's impossible to live the Christian life alone. With all the wrong motivation, with arrogance and emptiness, we have no hope of completing our real mission. Only through community, through a deep care and love for one another, through the collective transformation of our minds, from the selfish singular to the cooperative plural body, we become the active body of Christ to everyone around us. So as we go about our days, as, as you live your life, don't do it alone. Doing it alone is like working out only one arm. By not joining actively with the body of believers, you're depriving us of your role in the body. We need to care for one another. When even one person is forgotten or overlooked, it's like skipping leg day. We need to care for every part of the body. We need to live collectively with a singular purpose. If you feel alone, reach out. There are so many parts of the body that want to partner with you, that deeply care about your well-being. If you see someone living a singular Christian faith, reach out to them. Encourage them. Lift them up. We are together the body of Christ, so we need to live like it. So let's pray. Father, thank you for welcoming us into your family, for the great gift of being part of the body of Christ. Humble us when we think we can do this life on our own. Connect us with other believers that are seeking you. Bless our community and give us an attitude of action to use our specific gifts to bless one another. Be with us this next week and thank you for continuing to transform our community into the image and body of Christ. Amen.